Question uh, 37 to 39. Okay, so we have something about Coriolanus and external bipping. <laughs> if uh, if you um, happen to be uh, one of the students who took the uh, science review course uh, that I give, um, I, I've been uh, doing it for four years now, and uh, the first science review course that I did for the GAMSAT um, uh, included this diagram <laughs> because it's from a 1979 Scientific American article, which is very popular uh, among uh, people who create <laughs> multiple choice questions. And then after that, after that, yes, indeed, in 2010, um, Acer uh, published for the first time the Purple Booklet. So, um, uh, but of course, the questions are different. Anyway, so uh, taking a look at this, you see why it's, it's so interesting because um, there's so many different elements here uh, on the x-axis, on the y-axis. There's, the, uh, there's the anatomy, there's the sum of different parts, coriolantos, coriolantos, and lung. And, and so there's a lot of different things uh, going on here. But first, you just take a general look, very brief, get an idea of what's going on, then get to the questions. So um, the first question, 37, says... Uh, Anaerobic respiration, of course, anaerobic means no oxygen is being used, uh, is likely the only, underline only, respiratory metabolism mechanism. And um, so when we look at the graph and we look at the uh, y-axis where it says oxygen uptake, the only time that the, um, the, uh, the embryo is not having any oxygen uptake is really in the first couple of days, let's say two days, two and a half days. But uh, you can see at day four, it's already uh, using a thing. And then internal pipping, that, that occurs uh, on hour 15, say more or less, um, on day 19. You can see how the graph keeps changing, uh, you know, on, on the uh, x-axis. And then external pipping and all of that, that occurs even later. So, um, so the answer would be D. During none of those stages is uh, is anaerobic the exclusive uh, part that's being used. Okay, so uh, moving on to question 38 and uh, 39 using some additional information. Well, okay, so that's a graph and a half, isn't it? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that I, I suggest is that when you, when you see a graph, you know, try to look at you know, how it's labeled. Uh, next, go for the x-axis. Next, go for the y-axis. Uh, next, on, just in case you missed it, check again whether or not there's anything that is exponential or logarithmic about the graph. And then finally, um, the last thing is consider, if you think it might be necessary, what would the area under the curve give you or what would the slope give you? And you'll be able to always consider that based on, um, on the units of the x and y axis. That'll allow you to know that. So basically, um, if we're looking at this, you know, just so that, you know, because if you do this as a routine, you can do this in, in just a few seconds. It'll just take you a few seconds. First, you look for the label. It's labeled figure two. Thanks. <laughs> so that's not going to help. But, but when you look at the figure um, overall, just glance at it you get a sense that if it were to be properly labeled, it would probably be labeled something like anatomy and graphic trends um, across an eggshell. Because you see an eggshell uh, front and then you see the graph, but you also see the anatomy of the eggshell, which is a little interesting. It's, it's a bit unusual to have that. But of course, it, unusual in the sense of the real world, but it's not unusual for the GAMSAT, so expect it. So, um, so you have this correlation between the anatomy and uh, what's occurring graphically at those different locations. So it, it makes it um, quite interesting. So, so that's sort of the, the label, just a, getting a general idea of what, what it's all about, basically. Then you have the x-axis, and you look at it, and the x-axis is doing all kinds of unusual things. First of all, it's going down as you move to the right. It usually goes up when you go right. And, um, and the other thing is it, it's broken in a couple of places. So there's one place it's about oxygen, the other place about carbon dioxide, the other place it's about uh, water vapor. So it's broken in those areas. Okay, but one of the things I am checking is that the difference 
along the x-axis is always the same because Acer likes to have some questions based on that where the difference has changed. Like for example, it's going from 150 to 125 to 100. So it's a change of 25 each time. And that same change occurs when the uh, graph is broken because sometimes they'll break the graph and then it'll be different um, type of units. And I think you could see that there are different types of units in a broken graph in figure one. So uh, it goes from days then down to hours. Um, so you have to be very careful uh, with that. So that's the x-axis. Then there's the y-axis. And here you see that as you go down the y-axis, the numbers are going up. So again, it's the reverse of what you would expect, but they are referring to depth. So there's a certain logic to it, but it's just that it's not um, common. It's not the, the most common thing that you would expect. So at least you observe it. And, uh, and then you relate the depth to the fact that there's the anatomy of the egg shelf to the far left. And then uh, finally, the exponent and logarithm thing, because they really will try to catch you on that. Graphs that are um, you know, exponential curves or logarithmic curves. And, um, and so they're increasing at incredible rates. Um, and you have to be aware of it, even though the, the difference between any two points might be the same, just like 25, 25, but it's increasing by an exponential number. So you have to be careful with that. And so that's not the case in this particular situation, so we're not worried. And then there's the area under the curve or slope. Um, so, you know, this, the area under the curve is just going to be, you know, x times y. <laughs> You know, that's how you get the area of a box. You go X times Y and you got the area. So, um, so then it would be, in this case, it would be tor, which is pressure times millimeters, which is uh, length. So that doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't ring any bells for me uh, off the, just off the bat. You know, if it was force times distance, then I would think of uh, work, okay, because work is force times distance. But of course, it wouldn't be for a passage like this. But um, just so you know, just in the back of your mind, uh, uh, and then the other thing too is the slope, which is the um, rise over run, change in y over change in x. So that would be the change in depth over the change in uh, in pressure. That also doesn't do anything for me right now. But if if the y if the x-axis was uh, time, well, so many things are about the rate at which something happens. So if you had if you had um, anything, <laughs> you know, a pressure uh, on the y-axis, if you had uh, length on the y-axis, as we do right here, if you had whatever on the y-axis, if, if, it, if the x-axis is time, then that's a rate. And, and that is a very common question uh, for the GAMSAT. But none of that's happening here. But I just want you to have this standard way so that, uh, you know, you, you can approach things or at least you can consider it. So um, the first, uh, so after you appreciate the beauty of this graph, then you move on to the questions. Uh, which of the following is best estimate uh, for the difference of carbon dioxide? Uh, partial pressures, and of course, partial pressures for gas is, is a means of concentration, talking about concentration, in oxygenated and venous blood. So we look at the part of the graph that has to do with carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and then um, we look uh, uh, low down and we see, we see a little arrow that is going up um, from about 50. And then there's an arrow going down uh, in the carbon dioxide graph. And it's somewhere um, between um, 25 and 50, but uh, really more towards the 50. So, you know, we can't say exactly where it is, but, but perhaps it's 40. Okay. Uh, but it's definitely, the midpoint here would be 37.5. Okay, that would be the midpoint between these two. So it's definitely more to the left than the midpoint. So it's definitely the, um, the difference in pressure here would definitely be less than 12.5. So that we know for, for sure. And so the correct answer would be A. And uh, the unit is, is Tor. And in the back of your mind, hopefully uh, you do uh, remember that uh, one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So that's 101.3 thousand pascals. And uh, that is in turn equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is uh, equal to 760 tor. And of course, the SI unit for pressure is one pascal, which is a Newton per meter squared. So these are just, you know, things to uh, keep in the back of your mind. So um, moving on to question 39. 
considering the system described, the following partial normal functioning embryo. So which is normal functioning embryo? So the first one, A, is <clears throat> at a point in the bloodstream, water vapor partial pressure equals oxygen partial pressure. So now, looking at the uh, part for water vapor, the graph for water vapor, you see that once you get to 0.3 um, millimeters in depth, um, you have liquid water below that. You know, it really wouldn't make much sense to be talking about uh, water vapor inside of the bloodstream <laughs> because, uh, you know, inside the bloodstream, water vapor would actually become water liquid. So, and this is proven by uh, looking at the graph because there's only liquid water at 0.3 and below. So, and it's it's below 0.3 where you get the outer membrane, then the inner membrane, then the chorioallantois, which is presumably the placenta-like uh, structure that the bird has. And then below the chorioallantois presumably is the embryo. So, uh, so there's only liquid water below that. So to say that water vapor partial pressure equals oxygen partial, well, water vapor partial pressure, we, we have no evidence of any water vapor partial pressure uh, below uh, in the bloodstream. And then for oxygen partial pressure, at least uh, we could uh, take a little peek at that. Um, the oxygen partial pressure in the bloodstream, we can see it going from venous blood to oxygenated blood, and it seems to go something like this. We seem to have the number 50, we have the number 25, and uh, we see it extending from, from there uh, to, to about there. And, um, and so yeah, you can probably say that it goes from about 20 um, to somewhere around, let's say, 55. Okay, so so that will be the um, the range of partial pressure of the uh, oxygen in the bloodstream. Okay, so the, and of course there's no overlap there with uh, with zero with the number zero. So then uh, B uh, blood uh, oxygen partial pressure equals carbon dioxide partial pressure in the bloodstream at a point in the bloodstream. Sorry about that, uh, just a little uh, technical uh, glitch. So, um, just to say, Acer previously, in the, in the previous question, and they do this quite often, they made us look, okay? They made us look at this area and to uh, find the difference for carbon dioxide. They made us calculate that it's less than 12.5, so it's a 10. So now we can say that the range for carbon dioxide, I'll just I'll write this up here, is between um, 40 and 50. And we know that the range for oxygen, now that we have this habit, because we did in the previous question, now it's easier to do a more complicated question, as, as they often will, will do. Um, so and now we know that the range for oxygen is between 20 and 55. So there's an overlap between the numbers 40 and 50. So then truly we can say that at a point in the bloodstream, oxygen partial pressure equals carbon dioxide partial pressure. So there is such a point that, that exists in the bloodstream. Now, uh, wh when you look at the other answer choices, uh, with the egg outside the embryo, well, if you look at the egg outside the embryo, uh, it's for the water vapor pressure. The water vapor pressure seems to start somewhere around 45, okay, because you see that it's to the right of um, uh, 50, and then it goes down from there. So then uh, water vapor pressure um, goes uh, below 45 torr. And oxygen vapor pressure, if we're just looking outside of the, um, of the, uh, let's take a look here, outside of the embryo, uh, then uh, we see that oxygen is seems to be uh, somewhere around over 110. So obviously there's no intersection um, there. And then and for D, uh, the egg outside the embryo, again, oxygen partial pressure is above 110. And carbon dioxide partial pressure outside of the uh, embryo, if we take a look, I think you would agree, it's somewhere around 30, but then it goes down. So it's um, CO2 is uh, below uh, 30 outside of the embryo. So here, uh, all these uh, figures um, are clear. Even if you say it's plus or minus five or plus or minus 10, uh, it's very clearly different. There's no overlap, but there's clear overlap for, question, for answer choice B. And so um, uh, 39 
uh, B would be the correct answer. And if you wanted to uh, do some review of uh, respiration, I'm not sure why, but <laughs> well, anyway, it's a, it's a good background information. It makes you just work a little faster. Um, you can go to those sections.